Good afternoon, and thank you again for coming to our annual general meeting this year. Start off with just uh, my plain language advisory that I have every year. Uh, I'm going to tell you about my vision of Pato's future today. I'm going to also tell you where I think commodity prices are going to go. These are called forward-looking statements. I'm going to try and be truthful, obviously, and use everything I know about Pato in the industry to predict the future, but I will likely be wrong on both accounts, almost certainly the commodity price. Oil and gas exploration and production is a risky business, so please do your homework before making an investment, and uh, don't blame me if it doesn't work out. The end of 2018 marked a significant milestone for us here at Pato. On October 23rd, 2018, we celebrated our 20th anniversary as a company. And of course, we've taken a few forms over those last 20 years. When Don started Pato back in 1998 as a junior EMP, grassroots, with nothing, basically. Um, we grew as a junior corp for about five years until 2003. And then, of course, there's some gray hair in this room, so people will remember that in 2003, we converted to an energy trust. And we were an energy trust from mid-2003 until the end of 2010. And then we converted back to an intermediate dividend-paying EMP corp from 2010 until today. And uh, that's the 20 years. But, you know, in a lot of ways, we're essentially exactly the same company that we were in 1998 when Don started Pato, A lot of the same strategy. Lasting that long in the industry is no easy feat. And so I think 20 years in and of itself is quite an accomplishment. I look back at the TSE oil and gas index from 1998 to see who was around when we started. And anybody who's familiar with the industry and has the gray hair I have will recognize many of the names on the left-hand columns there. I actually worked for four of those companies. Petro-Canada, Anderson, Renaissance, and Rio Alto, all before coming to Pato. Um, none of them still exist today, unfortunately. Uh, and no, it wasn't my fault. <laughs> but it is interesting to see who still does exist today. Uh, only six of those companies out of the 51 are left, in more or less, less their original form. And there's also, of course, a few ex-trusts that weren't in the index back then, like ARC and Interplus Vermilion. They're still around today. But it really goes to show you that perseverance in this industry uh, is quite an accomplishment in and of itself. But really, we did a lot more than just persevere over the last 20 years. Uh, as that graph shows, we've had quite a ride. We've invested over $6 billion in capital projects almost all of it organic activity, investment ideas that we came up with ourselves to buy land, shoot seismic, drill wells, develop reserves and production, build the facilities and pipelines necessary to produce that. That activity has generated to date almost exactly the same amount of cash flow. We've made $6 billion in cash flow off that $6 billion of capital investment, and it's predicted to throw off another $2.5 billion in profits or earnings. And we've shared those profits with our shareholders and our unit holders over the last 20 years, some $2.4 billion. And today we're the fifth or sixth largest natural gas producer in Canada. So I think we've done just a little bit more than persevere. From day one, our desire was to deliver a superior total return to shareholders, growing our value, our income, our assets, all on a per share basis. And over 20 years, I think we've been successful doing that. Production per share has grown at a compound annual rate of 21%. Reserves per share have grown at 15%. Funds from operations per share at 16%. And value debt adjusted per share at 12%. And perhaps it's not all nice linear growth like we'd like to draw. Uh, there's, that's not really how a commodity business works, of course, with commodity cycles. There's often spurts of growth and then quieter periods. We've had that too. But all in all, I think uh, we've definitely accomplished what we set out to do at Pato. This is how I like to look at our accomplishments to date. We started with a share price of seven and a half cents. To date, we've paid out the profits on that $6 billion of capital we invested of $19 a share. And of course, the market's gonna value our future prospects, depending on where the commodity prices are and on the sentiment of the day. Today, it seems the market feels like our prospects aren't worth very much, unfortunately which is kind of surprising considering natural gas consumption in North America is at a record level. And we just posted, I think, our 57th consecutive quarter of earnings. But I guess there is a bigger picture at play. So maybe I'll take a few moments and talk about that bigger picture. Looking at the really big picture, human population on this planet that we call home currently sits around 7.6 billion people. And the majority of those are on continents on the other side of the planet from where we are. 
And that population is expected to actually grow, increasing by another billion people over the next decade or so, which really is just around the corner. And all of those people need energy, all types of energy, whether it's coal or oil or gas or nuclear or renewables or wood or even cow dung. It is a fact that energy directly contributes to quality of life. The more energy you have at your disposal, the longer you live and the better your living conditions. On average, people who enjoy our quality of life, or the lifestyle that all of us in this room really take for granted, use 34 barrels of oil equivalent a day. That's 20% of the humans on the planet. The other 80% all want what we have. Just under half the planet only have access to less than four barrels of oil equivalent a day. Some less than one. Those are the ones still heating their huts and cooking with cow dung. You have to ask yourself, what right do we have to tell them that they can't have what we have? What right do we have to say we're the only ones that get to have 34 barrels of oil equivalent a day? We're the only ones that get to have energy abundance. Or are we prepared to give our energy to them and accept a shorter life, a worse quality of life for us and our kids? These are the issues that we really need to debate when we talk about Canadian energy projects. Canadians, by the way, with our cold winters and long distances, we use 67 barrels of oil equivalent per day each, more than anybody else on the planet. What we really need on this planet, we need more energy of every kind. And the reality is we can't grow energy supply fast enough. As it is, we're consuming 100 million barrels of oil each day. We're consuming 360 billion cubic feet of natural gas every day. We're consuming 20 tons of coal every single day, plus all the nuclear, plus all the hydro, plus all the renewable projects we've managed to get off the ground. Can you imagine what kind of lifestyle we would all enjoy, or not, if we didn't have hydrocarbons, as some suggest we shouldn't? The reality is hydrocarbons are so intertwined with our daily lives, it is virtually impossible to imagine a life without them, and I don't think we really want to. But, and this is the big but, the more hydrocarbons we use and the more people that have them means the greater the pollution. And the more pollution we create with the consumption of energy, the worse off we are. I think we can all agree on that, regardless of whether you believe man is causing climate change or not. And there are a lot of people in this world particularly those with energy abundance, who do believe that man is the cause of climate change. So who wins the crisis of our time? This one, do we sacrifice energy consumption and therefore quality of life? Or do we ignore the climate change risks and continue to pursue more energy to improve the average quality of life for people on the planet? That's the debate. And if we pursue the growth in energy option, mostly for the benefit of the other half of the population, really, the projections are that China, India, all the rest of Asia will become the biggest consumers on the planet. During our lifespan alone, the rate of energy consumption will virtually double. So the question I always have is, who's going to provide all that energy? And where do they get it? And remember, it's not the production of energy that generates all the pollution and harmful emissions, it's the consumption. Only 10% is, is generated through production. 80% of the emissions are generated on the consumption. We need to make sure that the people on this planet that are going to be consuming all this energy to make their lives better have the right kind of energy at their disposal. And I think we can all agree we want less pollution, a cleaner planet for our children. So that energy demand needs to be satisfied by cleaner fuels, like natural gas, like renewables, which of course have to be backed up by natural gas. Even just to bring the bottom of half of the planet up to the same level of quality of life as they have in maybe Turkey or China, which brings them up to 14 barrels of oil equivalent a day, we would have to double the amount of oil production in the world today. Another 100 million barrels of oil a day. And me personally, you know, I'd like to see us improve on the current pollution problem, not just maintain it. So as a start, maybe we uh, replace a bunch of coal with clean burning natural gas. And then add a whole bunch of renewables. But we still have to hold the oil production flat. We still have to generate more hydro, more nuclear. 
Just to cut the coal in half though, we'd have to virtually double the natural gas. We'd have to go from 360 BCF a day to over 700 billion cubic feet of gas a day. And again, who gets to do that? I mean, it has to be one of the bigger countries from a reserves perspective. So you're looking at the US or Russia or Iran or Qatar, maybe China. Or maybe it should be us. No one has a better, more responsible industry than Canada. From our environmental regulations, to our human rights, to our indigenous consultation. We do it better than any other country with significant gas reserves. So we should be the logical choice to supply the rest of the world. You know, and within Canada, Pedro does it better than almost anyone. Our environmental leadership starts with having half the emissions intensity of the average gas producer in Canada. We use far less fresh water per barrel of reserves developed and we're far more efficient as evidenced by our industry leading low operating costs. But are we satisfied with being good? Even the best? No, nor should we be. We're still finding ways to be even better. We've reduced our methane emissions over the last six years by 37%. That's reduced our total emissions intensity by 27%. And we'll continue to find ways to do that even better. This year alone, we're installing 700 new ultra low emission controllers. That's gonna reduce our methane emissions even more, lower our intensities even more. I think that's a lot more than most consumers can say. And remember, production's only responsible for 10% of the energy emissions, 80% on combustion. Canadians have an amazing opportunity here to serve the rest of the world. We have energy in abundance here. We have a world-class energy industry by all measures. And we have the moral obligation to help the rest of the world out of abject poverty. Because if we don't, really someone else will. And they won't be nearly as responsible about it as we will be. Plus, if we can benefit our economy in the process, isn't this a win-win? You know, everybody wins if we promote more Canadian energy. I'm pretty sure almost everyone in this room believes that. So that's the big picture. So with that in mind, what's Pato gonna do about it? Well, for one thing, we're gonna continue to focus on developing nature's gas, which is organic, by the way. Our gas and NGLs are made up of all natural organic materials buried deep below the Earth's surface. They're sourced from coal-rich sediments derived from terrestrial plant matter and some marine sediments rich in plankton. Basically, we're just capturing the methane off Mother Nature's compost heap. It's a biogas, 200 million years old. In addition to working with Mother Nature, we're also gonna obviously work with you, our shareholders, because we are a publicly traded company and you are our partners. You're not our opportunity, you are our partners. And so we're gonna to continue to invest your capital as efficiently and profitably as possible. The timing of that investment though, needs to coincide with expanded access to market for our natural gas and for our natural gas liquids. Because otherwise we just dump the product on the market, drive the price down and destroy the value. But that expansion is happening. Over the next three years, starting this year, TC Energy, or TransCanada as they used to be known, will be significantly expanding their Nova system. They're investing $9 billion to give us greater access to market, 20% greater access. And that market, that, that's markets within Alberta, that's markets across Canada, and that's into all the markets in the US. It gets gas out of our basin to a greater North American market via their GTN line, their Canadian main line, and you know, beyond that, then we've got LNG exports coming down the pipe. There's a bit of misunderstanding about this market access expansion. Everybody thinks it's 2021 when it happens, but the reality is they're gonna be investing close to $3 billion every year for the next three years. Adding compression this year, mostly all along their pipe. They're adding some pipelines and compression next year, and then it's mostly pipelines they're installing in 2021. And every year over the next three years, as their capital's invested, we're gonna see additional capacity come onto the system. The compressors they're putting in this year at Latrinel, Swartz Creek, Nordegg, for example, those are 40,000 horsepower units. They're capable of moving about a 1.3 BCF a day, all through their system. But you know, the market we're pushing into is changing, and that's something we gotta be aware of. 
For the last 30 years, we've been in a demand-driven market in North America, where consumption, particularly in the US, consistently exceeded production. And you know, in that environment, uh, a consumer would literally come to the door of Alberta and buy all the natural gas and all the NGLs that we could produce. But in the last year, that has definitely changed. The US is now officially self-sufficient. In fact, they have more than they need, so now they're exporting two. Last year, they exported 10 and a half BCF a day, three of it through LNG, five of it to Mexico through pipe. They, they exported 2.3 BCF back into Eastern Canada. We exported 7.7 .7 Bs too, uh, to them, so we're both ne exporters now. We are now in what's called a supply-driven market, which means we need to push our product all the way to consumers. And we need to hang on to it for as long as we can to ensure that we get to extract the economic rent. Not the midstreamers, the processors, the marketers, or the pipe companies. The longer we hang on to it, the closer to the consumer we get, the more profit we get to retain at Pedo. So that's why we're changing a little. We're expanding our business to become a more integrated energy business. To include not only the exploration and development and the processing facilities, but things like storage, marketing, midstream infrastructure, even downstream. A completely integrated energy business, like the kind we used to have 30 years ago. The old days, Petro-Canada drilled wells, they produced, they processed, they refined, they shipped right to the retail. We need to hang on to that value chain for as long as we can. We still do all the upstream, of course, and being efficient and profitable here is still an important part of our business. We're still focused on the deep basin after 20 years for its predictability and its low risk resource plays. We're back working in the cardium again because it offers the most natural gas liquids today, especially condensates, which is attracting light oil pricing. We've also branched out now into the Montney. It's a new zone for us. It's a new play. It's not new play for the industry, but it's new play for Pado. And we're excited by that potential. And relative to the number of wells we're drilling, 50 this year, maybe 65, 70 wells next year, we have a ton of undeveloped inventory to choose from. Uh, we've even added to that over the last couple of years. So as access to market, and with it gas prices increase, uh, we're going to have a lot of other zones to choose from as well. Just as a refresher, recall the Cardium was where we started Pato 20 years ago. We positioned the majority of our lands in the Cardium on the Ram Barrier, which is this clean, thick, uh, tight sandstone sequence in the Cardium. Allows for more resource accommodation uh, in every section, more predictable results. And as I mentioned, over the last uh, 20 years, we've been accumulating this land position, but we've still been adding to it. Over the last two years and a quarter, we've added 157 gross sections of Cardium rights. 92 of those right here in the Greater Sundance area, where we have all this existing infrastructure. That's a 25% increase to our cardium land position in the last two years. And we're not done yet. It's a bunch more land posted this year. Plus, we're adding this land at a time which is really optimal. There's no competition, and the land prices are extremely cheap. The average acquisition cost of those 150 sections, 57 sections was $169 an acre. And Don and I can both remember when, back when I started in Pedo in 2001, we were buying land at 10 times that price. Now, our Cardian play is definitely still evolving. Uh, it's gotten much better over the last couple of years. We advanced a new completion design through 2018. Took a bit of testing in terms of different techniques, but we think we've settled on the most profitable design. We tried various open hole and case hole completion systems, diversion systems for the fracks. We compared those costs to the results. Over the last couple of years, we tried it all across the, the Cardium Fairway, from Brazo up through Greater Sundance, up even into Kakwa. And the innovative design that we've settled on uh, gives us improved productivity, it gives us improved reserve recovery, and of course it increases the profitability. And we seem to be getting very good execution in the field, very consistent results with this. And just recently, we've been working on this new targeting approach where we're integrating all the big data that we have gathered over the last 20 years in the Cardium to highlight the very best, most liquids-rich pockets of the Cardium on the trend. And the last dozen or so wells have been fantastic, coming in even better than expected. When we look back on the uh, post-mortem rate of return analysis, for instance, 
Uh, these new wells that we've drilled, uh, they're on the right here in red. Those are the Cardian wells in the first quarter, averaging 55% rate of return so far. So far better than we even got in 2018 on average. You can see the postmortem throughout 2018, our, our will rich and flare uh, plays didn't do so well. We were trying to target some liquid rich uh, portions of those, of those plays. They didn't work out as well, but our Nauta QM play worked out pretty good. And of course our Cardium was pretty good and wouldn't have, would, would have been actually even better had we not had to do the experimentation. That's uh, shown there in black. So going forward in 2019, we're looking to combine this new targeting technique with our innovative well design and we expect to even improve upon those 2019 results so far. So the other play we've been working on, as I mentioned, is our Monty play. Uh, this is a new play for Pato, one we developed in early 2018. We identified some opportunity in the south end of the Monty trend. That's that little box up in the far left corner. Uh, the middle Monty is still preserved here. I think the upper Monty and the lower Monty are eroded away, but the middle Monty is still 100 meters thick, so there's lots of it. Um, it's deeper here, about 1,000 meters deeper than what you're used to hearing about, which means it's more expensive to drill. Uh, but it also means we've got much higher pressure and there's more reserves uh, in every meter of pay because of that higher pressure. We went to land sales throughout the back half of 2018. We compiled about 50 sections of contiguous land under our West Wild Hay infrastructure. It was really cheap, two million bucks, less than $70 an acre. We've drilled our first well. We're gonna complete that here after breakup in June and uh, we're all pretty excited to see what it's gonna do. You can see on this map, there's a couple of old wells to the west of us. Uh, CNRL and Tourmaline had a couple of old wells. We've watched their production. It's actually sweet production. There's no H2S in it. And then there's some new wells drilled to the north by Denarian. There's three of them on production. They're getting better every month. Pretty strong liquid yield wells. And uh, they've got some CH2S in them. So we're not quite sure whether we're going to be sour or sweet with our well. But we expect the NGLs to be somewhere in the middle, about 50 barrels a million. So that's actually pretty close to... Uh, to our cardium. So that's our traditional EMP business. And as I mentioned, that's not enough anymore. Now we have to integrate the downstream components. And as you know, Pato owns and operates a large midstream asset base. Uh, we've got gas processing plants and pipeline networks all across our land base. They're all sweet refrigeration and compression facilities that we built ourselves. They're all highly efficient, clean burning, low emissions. They're all modular in design so we can move them around. We can maintain our low operating costs uh, across the entire life cycle. Our gathering systems are also all relatively new. They've all got corrosion protection in them. Our well sites were all built by us as well. And these are the ones, of course, that we're converting over to these ultra low emission pumps and controllers so that we can improve our environmental performance, reduce our methane emissions even more. In total, we've got about 850 million a day of processing capacity which, you know, when you look at midstream market uh, valuations would probably be worth something over a billion and a half dollars alone. We're also continuing to look at additional infrastructure investments that leverage our existing assets and their optimal location. Things like more deep cut additions, uh, infield fractionation we're looking at, NGL export options we're looking at, the current Fort Saskatchewan fractionation capacity, which is where all the liquids get broken into their individual pure components, is trending towards full. And so, You've got a lot of larger producers today that are looking at, can they do that work themselves? So we're looking at partnership options for that, especially since we're located so conveniently next to CN Rails Line. Uh, at this point, there's only a couple large producers really in the whole industry that have their own frack plants. But I think that's gonna start to change. Typical pipe and frack fees cost about five to $15 a barrel. So that's the kind of savings we can get or value that we can preserve for ourselves if we can do it ourselves. So that's the exploration and development business. That's the production and processing business. You go even further down the value chain, you're starting to look at things like storage, marketing options to try and take advantage maybe of seasonal variants in the commodity. We recently acquired a depleted Viking pool right in the middle of Greater Sundance. Uh, that's gonna be perfect for a proprietary gas storage scheme. We're calling it the Big Sunny. There's a sister pool right next door called the Big Eddy, which is operated uh, by, oh, it's not TransCanada, it's TC Energy now. And, and that pool has actually cycled its capacity about five times over the last decade. But, but now Big Eddy actually isn't all that effective because TransCanada, <laughs> ironically enough, lacks the firm receipt service necessary to get that gas into the market in the wintertime. Pato, though, I mean, we contract a lot of firm receipt service, so we have that available to us. So we can use that to our advantage, inject gas in the summer at maybe low or maybe even negative gas price, 
and then pull it out in the winter at much, long, much stronger prices. We're, we're still in the early stages of design. Uh, we'll likely look at a, a smaller pilot project to text, test this concept. Um, but ultimately, we could be cycling up to 200 million a day during the summer and winter months. And considering right now the forward curve suggests that this summer's gas is going to be less than a dollar ACO, and the follow on winter is closer to two dollars, there's a lot of potential value in seasonal storage. It's things like this, this storage scheme that, you know, these are all the tools that we're starting to accumulate in our toolbox that help us maximize the value for shareholders. In addition to storage, we've also become much more sophisticated at market diversification. Some might argue that we're a bit late to this game. Um, we were the lowest cost producer in the basin, so we were trying to preserve a lot of optionality for us. Which direction do we send our gas? In the short term though, and for the next couple of years, we've pushed most of our gas production off to the NYMEX with basis deals, which are like synthetic transportation. About a third of our 2019 gas is uh, exposed outside of Alberta. Uh, over 50% of our 2020 gas is out, sold outside of Alberta. We'll continue to do that kind of thing, I think, in the short term. We've even locked in a lot of those prices. For this summer, for instance, we've actually hedged all of our gas on the NYMEX, so we're not exposed to the NYMEX spot price or even the ACO spot price for very much of our production at all. And then starting in 2021, uh, we've signed up for delivery service off Nova onto the mainline pipes so we can start to take physical capacity in those pipes. That's going to get us out to the other North American markets and we won't need as much of this synthetic transportation. And then beyond that, there's still offerings coming, uh, additional service offerings that allow us to really actively diversify into that North American market. In addition to those North American gas initiatives, we've also kept our options open for West Coast LNG. Uh, in 2018, we joined an LNG consortium of uh, 10 intermediate-sized gas producers. The consortium actually is led by the uh, Pacific Northwest LNG president, uh, Greg Kist. So he ran that for many years. Uh, currently, he's looking at all sorts of LNG export options for the consortium. So perhaps down the road, we will be feeding a gas export terminal and ultimately achieving that goal of getting our gas, our clean, responsibly developed natural gas to the rest of the world. The other component of diversification at Pedo that is often overlooked is product diversification. We add more and more cardium production this year and next year we're going to diversify our revenue stream away from natural gas and into the natural gas liquids, the propanes, the butanes, the pentanes, condensates. In 2019 we have more than 38% of our revenue coming from liquids production. That increases in 2020 to over 45%. And then the final component of our integration is looking at the end use, really, and some of the midstream processing options. And much like an integrated oil producer that refines and retails its end products, is there an opportunity to do the same thing with natural gas? About one third of all natural gas in North America is used to make less electricity. Another third is used to power many of our industries. So is there an opportunity for Pedo to get into that business? We've already done one deal to align ourselves with the local power generation company. We're going to feed them gas for about 15 years. Uh, but perhaps we can even look at doing more and getting into that power business ourselves. Something to think about as we watch this power market in Alberta evolve, uh, particularly under the new provincial government. There will be some big changes coming. And while we wait for this egress to expand, we've got this great midstream asset. All this extra processing capacity in our plants that we can make use of. So starting this year, we're actively looking for situations where we can get other producers to come into our plants. We can offer them our cost structure. We can lower their operating costs, while at the same time we fill up our facilities, we spread out our fixed costs. It really is a win-win situation. But you know, it's not always easy to convince our competitors to abandon the old mindsets and work collaboratively with us. Still, we're gonna give that a shot and see if we can gain some efficiency for us and the rest of the industry. So all that strategy and vertical integration planning brings us to today and our plan for this year and going forward. As we've indicated uh, through our press releases, we've cut back our capital program this year. Obviously, we've got to wait for this egress expansion to happen. Uh, we're down from 232 last year to around 175 or 150 to 200 million this year. Uh, we cut back our dividend, of course, from 120 million to 40 million. And we'll use that free cash flow to pay down debt and strengthen our balance sheet. And as I mentioned, we're still mopping up all these new opportunities and lands. We're still diversifying our markets, our gas markets particularly, away from ACO. And we're still offering up some of this excess capacity we have. So 
when that new egress comes online, we're going to be ready. We're going to be much stronger and we're going to be ready to go. And of course, cost control and profit margins are, we're going to continue to be an incredible focus for PETA. We always are focused on these kind of things because we know that's where our dividends ultimately come from. Last year, we lowered our total supply cost again down to $2.10 in MCFE. That's down now 35% in the last five years. And our pure cardium that we're developing this year should actually lower F&D costs even more. We're looking at closer to a buck uh, an MCF on F&D. We have a little bit of money exploratory capital to spend, but uh, I expect that we'll be pushing those supply costs down even more this year. So ultimately, you know, the plan is to get back up to that 100,000 barrel a day mark in the next three years as the egress comes online. This time, however, we'll have a lot more liquids rich production. It's probably closer to 35 to 40 barrels a million by the time we get there, which will be pretty close to the basin average at that point, I think. So that should give us sort of industry average revenues. And with our significantly lower cash costs, we'll be posting considerably above average profit margins and hopefully be in a position to start increasing the dividend again. So that's pretty much it. That's the latest update on Pato this year. Um, hopefully that gives you a lot more color about some of the issues that the industry is facing, some of the hurdles that we're jumping over, some of the opportunities that we're taking advantage of, and how we're really setting Pato up to thrive in what is now a brand new supply-driven market in North America. Well, thanks very much for coming, everybody. Um, and we'll see you next year.